Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to How to Win at Chess. This is a series where I take on my Twitch subscribers in 10 minute games and I go up the rating ladder, walking you through all the phases of the game and my thought process. Now, this episode is a very difficult one. Uh, it's the 20th episode of this series and it's been crazy successful thus far. So I figured that for the 20th episode, you know, we would, uh, we would step things up a little bit. The lowest rated player that I'm playing is 1,700. The highest rated player that I'm playing is 2,100. So it's going to be very intense. What better way to spend your bright Sunday morning with a nice sunny outside, birds are singing, than sitting in front of a screen and playing chess. Uh, before we jump into the games today, I do just want to say that uh, to celebrate the 20th episode, all of my courses are going to be 40% off. Uh, you can use the code 20, the word, not the number. So if you know how to spell 20, T-W-E-N-T-Y, uh, go check out the beginner bootcamp, intermediate bootcamp, uh, some of my opening courses, or anything in between. Um, and uh, with that, we're going we're gonna to kick things off. By the way, if you don't know how to get there, link is in the description. Or just go to GothamChess.com. You can't miss it. All right, first game up in the series. Uh, I am taking the black pieces versus Vlad. Uh, he plays e4. Now, I am going to play different things throughout this episode, but I got to start off with the ye old trusty. I got to play my Karo Khan defense. Um, it's my favorite opening. Uh, I've been playing it for the last decade, and obviously the point is that we want to take the center with c6 and d5. And there's actually a very decent chance that when I'm playing against my own subscribers that they play my own course recommendations against me. So actually here we see Vlad playing uh, the advanced Karo Khan, which is what I'm recommending in my e4 course with white. Uh, so this does sometimes happen. So bishop f5 is a move. Um, c5 is what I recommend. I think it's, uh, in, in the Karo Khan course, I, I think it's a very decent and flexible move. But let's see what happens if we do play, um, if we do play bishop f5. So bishop f5 is considered uh, a main line. So bishop f5, h4. This is literally me playing against my e4 course here. The point of h4 is that white wants to play g4 and lock the bishop away with the move h5. So h4 is known as the Tal variation, named after Mikhail Tal. Very decent move here. h5 is considered the best move. Uh, h6 is considered a secondary move, but there's another move that I, I really like to play. Very sneaky move, and it's the move queen c8. And the point of queen c8 is that you prevent the move g4. And also, you further support c5. So in the future, when you finish your center kind of solidity, you're going to be playing e6, and then the move c5. And then your queen is actually going to make a lot of sense. Okay, bishop d3. Yeah, in general, um, whenever this trade is available to us, we like it because, as our opponent has already indicated, they are interested in trapping our bishop. So if we have a way out, um, we definitely should trade. Uh, and you, you absolutely must play this move e6, okay? Because you stop the white pawns completely in their tracks, so white doesn't get to expand any more in the middle of the board. Uh, and then you're going to take queenside space with the move c5. And it's yet to be determined where these knights are going to go. We can't go to the traditional uh, knight f6 square, and that's why um, in these kind of high-level recordings of uh, win at chess... Um, uh, we, 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 we get into the, those, uh, those deeper concepts, such as, you know, you can't put your knight on this, on, on this square, so how do you play against the lack of space? So opponent has played the move f4. They now have five out of eight pawns on dark squares. I'm really liking our light square opportunities over here. c5 is still very much an option. I do also like knight h6 or knight e7 to put the knight on f5. I also like g6 or even h5. h5 is a nice move, just controlling some light squares. It's very difficult at this point to determine which of those moves is the right kind of continuation. Uh, I'm going to go with c5, knight c6, mostly because I don't want you to commit two squares for no reason at all. Um, when you commit pawn moves very early, there's no going back. Whereas this is what we want anyway. I mean, we want to expand. We want our knight to go to c6. We want to kind of build that up on the queen side. We don't exactly know what we want to do on the king side yet. Of course, knight h6 looks extremely natural. I should say that a move ago, it was not a natural move to play knight h6 because simply bishop takes pawn. I think a bird just crashed into my window. At least there's trees outside and sign of life. So CD4 is decent. Some of you might wonder about C4 here. I really don't like moves like this. They're just one move attacking moves. And once the queen moves out of the way, you now have the problem of the fact that you haven't actually opened up anything on the queen side. C4 could be okay, but I don't really see a reason to rush it. So I think I'm just going to play the move knight c6. Of course, if my opponent takes, I'm going to play bishop takes c5. There is an argument to be made I should have just taken 
and opened up the C file, but I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and in general, I'll, I'll say that in the first like uh, seven to ten moves of any chess game that you play, there is a there there is a lot that can happen, uh, and a lot of it is just equal. I mean, many many things can happen on both sides, and a lot of it is just equal. Now, I will say that in the next few moves, we're really going to understand what uh, what strength uh, of opponent we are facing, uh, and what I mean by that is you know they're playing a bunch of normal looking moves. In fact, this move, bishop e3, actually adds an attacker to this square, but uh, we'll see how good their positional play is. So, you never really want to play b6 to defend, uh, because you'd, you'd rather do something with, uh, with this pawn. Now, between taking or pushing, they both look okay, I must say. Even allowing my opponent to take and just relying on winning the pawn back in the future is not, not so stupid. I think I will take now. I'm going to take, uh, and my logic is that, again, in the long run, I, I, I do think an open C file will benefit me. Now, I could take again. If queen takes, then my queen is very useful and can take on C2. Knight B4 attacks the queen, but then there's a check, so I, I kind of get stopped in my tracks. Bishop B4 check is bad because you never want to really walk into a pawn move. Uh, bishop c5 could be interesting. I could just ignore the tension and try to play for knight h6, knight f5. In fact, I really like how this looks. So again, because my opponent has three out of four pawns over here on the dark squares, the f5 square is going to be really juicy. So is the g4 square just hopping right between the pawns. I'm not worried about a knight trade. I'm also not worried about knight b5, knight d6 because I just take it. There's nothing there. Um, only thing when you go to f5 is you want to make sure that the move g4 doesn't just kick you out immediately. So it's kind of the same thing like a bishop check. You can just get booted. So if you want to put your knight on a square, you have to make sure enemy pawn moves can't just kick you out effortlessly. For example, the move knight b5 is terrible because a6. And then I kicked out the knight. Okay, so now I can take with the queen of the pawn. And actually, both look very reasonable. I think I'm going to follow my, my philosophy for this game so far, which is opening the c file right the whole queen move justification um i'm gonna bring my rook over as well if the knight develops to c3 then bishop b4 makes a lot of sense because i can always take and damage the structure um okay queen e2 i don't understand at all i suppose that's trying to control this but i had no intention of going there anyway uh so i really like knight f5 i also really like rook c8 it's very tough to, for me to determine which one of those two moves is actually better right now uh, rook c8 opponent will just go c3. At that point, I have to ask myself if I'm improving my situation uh, or I'm improving it more for my opponent. I think I'm going to go knight f5. So the threat now is to take the bishop and obviously to take the pawn, but there's also a threat of just a very clean fork, uh, which would be nice. I would imagine that my opponent is now going to retreat the bishop to f2, which is a very natural looking move. And you'll notice that um, I haven't done too much, but I am just completely playing on the light squares of the position. So... Um, Right, rook c8 is also on a light square. We're targeting a light square. I mean, I do have a dark squared bishop that complements the setup. Like right now, for example, h5 is a very nice move because I prevent the move g4. Only question is, can I do anything faster like bishop c5? I really, of course, want to play h5, but I'm, but I'm, you know, maybe queen a4 attacking the f4 pawn, for example. f4 is very weak. Bishop e7, you know, bringing another piece out. Um... I do like bishop c5. It does look very good. I, 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 think, uh, I think I will play h5. I think I'm going to kind of demonstrate this, uh, this control of the light score. So my knight on f5 is, is definitely my best piece. Uh, it stands very confidently. The enemy pawns can't touch it. Uh, and, you know, opponent might already start thinking not about castling this way because, again, they've, uh, they've, they've committed so many pawns forward. They might consider castling queenside, but if they castle queenside, they're still getting bulldozed. So it's a very difficult situation with white. I, I, would, I would imagine... That here the evaluation is very close to minus 1.5. Like maybe minus, mm, maybe like minus 1. Maybe slightly above that, minus 1.1, minus 1.2. But it could be worse. I mean, the thing is that if white has almost no pawn play, it could get very bad very quickly. So I did just mention this move. Um, I have a flashy move. I can play bishop a3. So there's bishop b4 here, which is beautiful and, and nice. But bishop a3 is hilarious. And then if you take, I take this. But I'm also threatening to take on b2. So, uh, But I, I think I'm going to go bishop b4. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if after the game we analyzed then bishop a3 was like better. But again, I just want to take. 
just want to take. And and by the way, if short castle does happen, I even have ideas like this. I mean, wh white is white is really not safe here at all. Um, I actually think very slowly we are approaching a minus two and just completely lost position for white, just from a positional standpoint. Uh, too many light squared weaknesses, uh, incorrect coordination of the pieces, and it just goes to show you that at this level, um, at 1700, these mistakes are still very, very prevalent. And I mean, if you, if, if you just kind of slow it down and um, really focus on the issues in your opponent's position, what they can do and what they cannot do, uh, the game plan of your opening, understanding how to flow from the opening to the middle game uh, and, and what kind of complexes you're looking at, right? Like this, this knight on f5, right? Knight h6, knight f5. It's a very high level idea. It's a very high level idea. So, uh, and understanding all that, putting it all together. So opponents just letting me take. They, they are sacrificing a C pawn. That's what's happening here. They're sacrificing a C pawn in order to kind of consolidate and, and, and hope for the best. Now, before you just go gobbling this, right? Lower rated player just eats this up, no problem. I'm worried about queen b5 check. And that's a very important thing at this level is uh, respecting what your opponent's counterplay can actually be. So before I take this pawn, I almost want to play rook c8. Before I do that. Now, that might be very silly of me. Make no mistake, that might just be absurd. Um, it could just be simpler to just take this pawn. But I, but I am curious to see after the game if this is the best move. If the opponent waits for another move, I'm just going to go here or here. It's going to get real bad. I can castle. I just have to make sure that I'm not hanging this pawn, which is one of the issues of the position, of course. Castle's queen h5 can really change the game. Yeah, now we have a big question to ask. Do we move our king out of check or do we bring the queen back? I think I'm going to bring the queen back. I really don't want to risk too much counterplay. If I play king f8, there could be like queen b7. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the queen back. Uh, we did our job. And we're just going to be a pawn up in a much, much better middle to end game. Our knight is much better than the bishop. The bishop cannot touch our knight uh, at all the way it's standing right now. So uh, if takes, takes, you know, I'm going to bring my king out and then we're going to go to the next phase of the game, which is uh, two rooks and a piece. It's going to be a two rook and a piece end game. And we're going to we're going to see how to how to put that all together. So important in end games is uh, peace mobility. So the activity and the mobility of your pieces. This bishop has a bit of mobility, but no targets at all. This is a target, but I'll just move it. Um, the pawn play is almost impossible here for white as well, which is kind of funny. King d2 is a fantastic move, I have to say. That is an awesome move, because now you're trying to take this file. Yeah, very well done as a massive truck rolls by. And even though my knight is good, it, it, it doesn't participate in the game as much as I would like. So I'm going to play king d7. I actually, I actually like this idea by my opponent. I believe in this idea by my opponent. And now I'm going to use tactical defense. So I, so I could just stop the threat uh, of the rook infiltrating. But there is this move as well. Rook takes, rook takes. And if bishop takes pawn, I just zip right back. And then I take the pawn on a2. And then we clear out our a pawns and the board shrinks a little bit. Of course, I could have also prevented the infiltration just with my king, but it is important that you have to see what's the most important priority. The priority is the king's safety. The priority is not the pawn. You, you want to move the rook, don't move the pawn, okay? Because this comes, and that's, yeah, that's a very big deal. Um, so rook a8, exactly as I mentioned already. Yeah, bishop back to f2, uh, and now I'm, um, I'm just going to take. Now, I would imagine rook b1 is going to come again. You might as well try again with the second rook. At this point, I do believe that sliding my king over and protecting that rook infiltration is the way to go. Opponent might give me a check with the bishop. At this point, I have to not make the mistake of repeating moves, right? So, and also don't walk into the b file. So I think king c8 here is smart. Now this is still under attack. And again, we see the problem of the white position in the long run. This is, the, this, this is really the issue. So white can't just very freely develop. Now, we need to do a combination of a few things. We need to continue to hunt weaknesses, uh, but at the same time, we need to at some point expand with our pawns. Or we can trade rooks. Trading rooks is, is probably another way to handle this position. So I'm going to come back to a4 and touch this pawn. Right? That's, that's, uh, that's one of my game plans here. Just want to win all the pawns. Can't blame me. Now, g3, I'm going to go after this pawn as well. So every time my opponent is making a move, 
I'm just harassing uh, his weaknesses. I don't have that many weaknesses, right? Oh, Rook B3, wow. Okay. I think I should be able to successfully trade here and just win the game. Just uh, important how, how I figure this out. So, of course, I want to bring my king, and I do want to play the move C5. Uh, I think I also need to reroute my knight at some point. So first, I'm going to take one crack at the center. It's very important not to create any weaknesses here on the dark squares, because this bishop will just get there. All right, so if I can... Yeah, so now I'm really looking to make this move or just expand with all my pawns. So it's very important to me here that my opponent uh, cannot get too close to me, right? So king d6 and e5. It's a huge thing for me. So there's e5. And because I just have way too many pawns... Uh, I'm relying for my pawns to go down the board together. So it doesn't really matter to me if, if this trade occurs. And again, I'm doing a very good job here of controlling the pawn moves. What matters to me is that my pawns go together. So if that pawn trade happened or not, it didn't really make any difference. Um, okay, this is, yeah, this, sometimes this happens. People get a little bit desperate. The problem is that you actually do more harm than good because now, my, now I just have a pass G pawn. The only thing that I need to be careful about here is that I don't let this pawn run away. Oh, and that's fatal because I can cut the bishop off with the move d4. This is so important. I, I close the door completely, and actually the bishop cannot prevent me from, from queening anymore. So d4 shuts the door, and um, it, it wasn't the only winning move, but, but it's the fastest. It's the fastest winning move, and, and, and now we win. Yeah, I mean, g4 was a little bit desperate, but, but uh, it, was, it was slowly going to, to be in my favor regardless, because my knight is just so nifty in this situation. Um, it, it does such a good job of avoiding anything. Um, yeah, h6, but again, it's never too late to screw something up. You might as well just take this. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and I think he will maybe take... Okay, he's not going to... I don't know if he's going to resign or not. Um, and the fastest way to win here... I mean, just bring the queen back. And I guess he'll play till mate. Sometimes the higher rated players resign, but he is more than welcome to play until checkmate. So anytime you have king and queen like this, what I like to do is just, just get the king to the, to the side of the board. Uh, you can very quickly swarm with king and queen... Uh, and actually, this is mate. Kind of funny. This is a mate. You don't even need to take the pawn. Of course, you could take the pawn, but queen a7 is simply checkmate. That was a nice game. So, played this interesting queen c8 move, right, against bishop f5, although my Karl concourse is c5, but I like to, you know, uh, you know that we, we have advanced players watching. Queen c8 is a very tricky and interesting move. I believe the best move here for white is bishop e2. Um, or c4. Like bishop e2 to try to play g4. Unless I'm incorrect and I don't remember my analysis. Uh, but I always had some success here with bishop e2. But uh, queen c8 is a very tricky move. And look, after bishop takes d3, um, things are quite natural here. But uh, yeah, already this move f4 is actually a huge concession by white. Making huge weaknesses. Computer thinks that after f4, white is worse. And I mentioned here that I thought the evaluation was uh, minus 1. Yeah, it's minus 1.5. In fact, the, the evaluation after h5 is, is minus 1.3, but the evaluation after bishop c5 is minus 1.6. So we played very well by controlling the light squares, and here, the best move, remember I said queen c3 allows queen b5? The best move is rook c8. Staying patient, not allowing any counterplay, and if the opponent tries to defend, I go queen a4. That's very interesting that the computer actually gives nearly double evaluation here, not taking the free pawn in front of the king, because that allows a queen infiltration. Fascinating stuff. But that's why you're watching, right? Are you still with me, 18 minutes in? So queen a4. And the rest was self-explanatory. I mean, we got, you know, we got the, uh, the end game we wanted, we controlled the infiltration of the rook, and it's totally winning. Um, it's just a totally winning position, but obviously we just have to figure it out. Now there's some sort of bells going off outside. Sunday in New York, you know, the whole community is out on the street uh, being together. So, yeah, that's the Karo Khan, Bishop F5 in a nutshell, playing against that H4 variation. Um, here we go. Hmm. I'll play D4. Bells are so loud. Jeez. Okay, um, let's play a Trumpowski. So d4, c4 main lines I, I play a lot. d4, knight, f6, bishop, g5 uh, is a very interesting one as well. So I'm going to take. And now what you do here is play e3 and g3. So because I've traded off my uh, dark square bishop, 
Sorry, these bells are driving me nuts. I don't even know if you guys can hear them live during the recording, but... Uh, and sometimes I complain about noise on the street, and you guys are like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. So, because you've traded off your dark squared bishop, you now put all the pawns on the dark squares, and you pressure the center. And now I'm going to go knight e2, and in the long run, I'm going to build up on the queen side here. So my opponent's playing c6, doing a nice job there, controlling my movement. I'm going to castle. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you can see, the structure is incredibly solid for white. So now knight d2, b3, or c4 are pretty natural. I'm going to go knight d2 and, uh, and play for this move c4. Now, my opponent... Mm, interesting. So in general, whenever bishops arrive like this, I would like to... See how much noise is outside? It's insane. I like to ask where they're going. So if the bishop were to back up, there would have been g4. Um, now my opponent doesn't even have the bishop pair, which is actually the major advantage of the Trumpowski. There is a threat here, though, folks. There is a threat hidden with this move f5. We cannot just go chugging along with our plan. Anytime you see queen and rook on the opposite lines from each other, you do have to take a look, right? Bishop takes d4. So right now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly drop my queen into d3. And that's why you're watching this episode for moves like queen d3, because... Again, you, you have certain game plans that you know you're trying to implement, but the board, you, can't, you cannot be selfish on the board. Your opponent is also trying to implement all sorts of plans. Uh, so here we go. There's the move c4. Um, and in a perfect world, I isolate my opponent's pawn on that square. Uh, if I take now, the knight will probably take. So what I also like to do in, 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 in the Trumpowski is just expand literally with every pawn. So I will put my rooks behind the pawns, and play a4, a5, b5, because the thing is, once I shred open the middle, my light squared bishop is a killer. And the difference in the quality of our bishops is huge. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a massive difference. a4 now. Look at this. This is uh, <laughs> very, 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 very fun to play like this in the Trumpowski. You just play a4, b4, b5. Um, Trumpowski is one of, my, my, one of my recommendations in d4 Dynamite. Use code uh, 20. Spell it out, T-W-E-N-T-Y. And, uh, you know, you get, uh, get your 40% off. That's one of my recommendations. Queen d6 attacks this. Couple options. Push pawn, attack queen, put the rook behind the pawn. I have to think what I want in the long run with this pawn. I mean, if I want to take or, or do I want to push and try to crack through with b5. If I push, is a very important thing. This tension on the center makes black focus here but if i push then the pressure here is gone so i, I you know like w once i get here i have to bulldoze and try to win that pawn so i think in the long run it's better for me to keep the pawn here for now again pawn moves you got to be very careful about when you when you commit to such pawn moves rook b1 is a nice move uh because i i, I can keep the option of b5 open without actually moving my c pawn so i can play b5 and then I can chop, and I can chop, and slowly but surely, I'm going to split these pawns and zoom in with my pieces. My bishop has a massive role in my attack. This bishop doesn't have such a big role. Knight e4 is a good move. It's a very thematic move. Thematic meaning that because you have these two pawns and the rook controlling the e4 square, you might as well put your knight. So now the question is, do I take, do I ignore, what do I do? If I take, opponent takes, and uh, I'm stuck... Right, my, I, I'm going to have to come up with a new game plan, like rerouting my bishop, moving my rook. If I take with the bishop, I think I'm just kind of an idiot, because my bishop is the entire purpose of my position. Uh, I could slow play, right? So I can play something like uh, rook c1. Not making any commitments just yet. Uh, it also is important to any time that you are looking at squares near your king, if only your king is protecting something, you have to make sure there's no sacrifices. I'll give you an example. Knight takes g3 looks really interesting. It doesn't work because queen comes in and my knight is able to come back. And in general, you should not sacrifice pieces near like, like this if you just have a queen. If it's a queen attacking an army of a king, a queen, a knight, and a bishop, and maybe a rook, it's not going to work. You know, the queen's not Jason Bourne. Uh, so this way we... We have kind of gotten every single check mark of a typical Trumpowski middle game. But at the 1800 level, people don't just fall over and die, you know? Yeah, they're going to fight back. I mean, h5 is a, like I said, thematic move. You know, you've got all this going this way. Um, so there's h5. 
Uh, H4 is an interesting move. Coming up, uh, we might play H4 ourselves. I kind of like H4 myself. I also kind of like maybe taking. It's interesting. I, 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 I don't know what the best way to go is. H4 is very strong and very annoying, I, I must say. Hmm. Can go C5 and continue marching, but C5, the queen slides back and there's nothing really there. So, yeah, what to do? Okay, I'm going to play h4. I think my opponent has convinced me that uh, h4 is necessary. And again, uh, they can either completely, you know, take their foot off the gas on this, on this kingside position, or they could... I don't, I don't know. Knight takes g3 is very interesting move, potentially. Especially because the difference now and, and the way it just was, was that when the queen gets in, like a move ago, my h3 pawn was not a weakness. But now, I have a pawn on h4, so if you sack and take, you might win the third pawn. I don't know. Anything is possible. <clears throat> However, if the opponent... Yeah, so this is what I thought would happen. I thought that the opponent would try to play something like this. Yeah. This is about to get really crazy. So, I think I have to take... I think I'm going to take on g5. I think it, I cannot allow my position to get ruined by, uh, by a pawn attack. Okay, queen rotates, and I guess they're trying to take one of these two ways. So, a couple of options here. Um, obviously, I can always take on e4. I can take on d5 first, and then I can sort of see what happens. Uh, I think I'm going to do that. I actually think I'm going to just slow things down real quick and take on d5. Now, sometimes the best way to deal with a strike on the edge of the board where your opponent's trying to line up all their forces is back in the middle. Because when the position is more locked in the center, attacks are stronger. However, when you open up the center, for example, when you open up the center, right, and make this pawn an isolated target when it takes, that's better for the person defending. If I played c5, black has a completely locked center, and since I'm not able to transfer forces through the middle of the board, um, it's harder for me to defend my position. But now if this knight moves, I suddenly can take a pawn, right? So right here, for example, I could go to c7, not c6, but c7. And if I go to c7, I'm suddenly creating problems, right? I'm thinking knight f3, actually. I, I, I actually kind of like the move knight f3. Uh, I, I also do like the move rook c7. So I, I like a couple of things here. Uh, I don't know which one is the best move. I am going to play knight f3, though. And I think because this controls the pawn moves, next I can double up and then take complete control of the c-file, uh, and then we're going to be in good shape. If knight takes g5, I can take and then take on d5, but I was also thinking to play knight h4, fork the queen and the pawn on f5. So... Man, now there's, uh, now there's barking. There was bells, a loud truck, dog barking, wild times. Okay, rook c8. My opponent is not interested in giving me an easy game of chess. Okay. When you have rooks like this on the same file, you... Yo, dog... I don't understand. How, like, how, how does the dog just outside bark like 50 times? I mean, th is it alone? And why is it alone? Is the owner just letting it bark? Why is he letting it bark? I just never understand stuff like this. Actually, some, some, in some countries, there's just stray dogs walking around, but uh, stray animals, cats, dogs. Not in New York. New York, they're supposed to be inside. Anyway. Um, Rook C2 is a very advanced move, I think. Uh, it's one of these moves where you don't want to take the rook because then he's going to control the whole file. So I inch my rook up one square because if he takes my rook i slide back and i still control the whole file but i'm preparing this move and i want to go back this is a very critical move in the game i want to see after the game if rook c2 was the best move i did not surrender control of the c file and i played rook c2 and i'm going to build up behind my rook right so 
That's the idea. To play rook c2, to double up, and then um, deal with everything later. I like that the black attack has been frozen. I think, though, bishop f8 is a, is a nice move here. Oh, but bishop f8 might allow knight e5. You see, like, uh, once, once you leave a certain spot on the board, you allow your opponent to get back into the game. So, um, with, with a move like knight e5. But listen, knight e5, he could just take on g5. Again, if my opponent gets a queen here and gets to play h4, like, let's say this doesn't exist, queen takes pawn, uh, push, I'm in trouble, because between these three pieces, the queen, the knight, and the pawn, I, I don't have a very happy king. Uh, and that's really what chess is all about at the end of the day. I mean, it's, it's just... Trying to desperately defend your king, who is not a very powerful piece. That's a weird move, though. Um, that move kind of gives me some hope. Because... I like queen b3 here, but, I mean, why Okay, I mean... But now I'm just a pawn up. So now you let me... A couple of moves ago, you let me take on g5. Let me take on g5. Now you let the same pawn take on f6. I don't know about that. I mean, I don't know. Now I'm just the pawn up. Now I don't even have a material. Oh my God, you're not even taking it. What? Whoa. Okay, so obviously we have to start looking at various sacrifices, right? That seems to be the idea here. But there's... Does, does that actually... Knight takes g3? Really? Okay, well, we did just mention that this bishop moving does allow knight e5, right? So I, I am... Very much considering this move. I am also very much considering just taking the rook. I'm also considering the move f7. Oh, but then queen takes. That doesn't do anything. Mm. Takes, takes, knight e5. Dog is still barking. Crazy. Uh... Here... To target this. But the thing is, if I move, they deflect me. So I can't do that. I also only have three minutes. Hmm. Okay, here's the plan. First, we have to shut that dog up. Here's the plan. I am going to play... Rook c1. So this move forces a response. Yes. Now, I'll take with the rook. And when this happens, I will go here. So this move doesn't actually work, I don't think. Because again, I'm up too much, too much material and I have way too bolstered of a position. So it cannot work. There's no way it works. I'm telling you right now. No way. I just, I have a rook guarding, a queen guarding, a knight and a bishop. Like, I just have too many forces here around my, my, my own king. So, if this happens, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fly into e5. And then we are going to attack. Anyway, that's the plan. Right on cue. So I, I, I think just here. Very cool, calm, and collected. Knight e5. Don't even take it. I go to e5, and now, now, now here's the problem. This knight has no moves. Because the queen's under attack. If you check me, I take it for free. And here's the other issue. If you take my pawn, because I actually am threatening f7 check. If you take my pawn, I go here. At this level, sacrifices have to be absolutely, you know, you got to be 100% sure that you didn't just look at pawn takes knight, right? Because when you play knight takes here, you're thinking pawn takes knight, and then you're thinking check. And even that probably doesn't work. But sometimes you get hit with this cold shower of a move. By the way, I can even play bishop check and then take. But I'm just going to take, and now you don't have this. So I have disconnected your rook from the game uh, and now you are down a full piece. So being a full piece down with that... And it's not just any full piece. I mean, I got a dominant knight in the middle of the board. It's rough. Queen g5 does go for this. Um, and I guess this. 
I'll take with check. Oh, and yeah, it's 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 very bad. Actually, I think the, the game is probably close to over. King f8 is the only move, I think. If king h7, I play rook c7. I don't think you can let me get my rook in. I don't think you can let me get my rook in anyway, but... Yeah, I, I think it's... Well, I don't see an immediate win for me after king f8. Yeah, I... I don't know. I'm like trying to find it. I don't see it. And again, it's it's never too late to do something stupid. Maybe rook f2 here and just go for f5. Queen g3, just block. Yeah, I think this is smart. If queen e3, I have queen f5, and that should probably lead to a very quick checkmate. I thought about rook g2 here, but yeah, I just think here, right? That should be fine. We threaten queen f5 and rook f5. Once our queen and rook take and bulldoze on the f-file, the game will be over immediately. So check, I can even drop my bishop back. And then queen f5, and that's the game. So this was good. This was the Trumpowski. This was a positional style Trumpowski. We had to deal with some strong counterplay by, by, by our opponent. We controlled that counterplay. We dealt with that counterplay. We understood the problem, and when the opponent rotated the pieces over to start that counterattack on our, on our king side, we struck in the middle. That's, that's how this top-level you know, top stuff works. Okay, top-level is, I mean, not super GMs, but uh, being an 1800 in the world of chess is already like 99th percentile, so uh, this, this person is better than 99% of chess players on Earth. And so was the last guy, and so will all the other people in this video. So um, this, is, uh, this seems to be the conclusion. And this should be it. Queen f5. I mean, there's f4, actually. Now that I'm looking at the position one more time, there is f4. King e7 is a, is a decent attempt, I think, at running away. Uh, but it should not work. I said, once my queen and rook get in, it is game over. Oh, and another thing that we have today on Sunday is a t weird lighting situation that's so bright outside. My overhead light is doing some weird stuff. Queen d7 is main in one. Um, that light, my white light is doing some crazy stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, queen f5 and... Uh, all right, my opponent's uh, stalling out the clock here, looking for a way to, uh, to save the game, but there is no way. Hopefully they don't just flag, they... Okay, Queen E6 is mate. Um, GG, that was a good game, honestly. I, 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 I was curious about one thing a little bit later uh, in the game. Uh, and uh, yeah, so G5 actually was a mistake. C takes D5 is the best move here. And a little later, is Rook C2 the best move? Wow. Do you want to know how savage the computer is? It wants White to play Rook C5 <coughs> and lose the Rook. And the computer says that this knight is actually better than this rook. Remember I said move the rook up one square and then take control of the file like this? That's actually nuts. Rook c5 is a suggestion by the computer and it's trying to sack and basically say well, black has no more play for the rest of the game. It's incredible. I mean, Stockfish is such a scumbag. But that was a, that was a fun game. That was a very fun game. Uh, let's go to the next one. Velirad. I will take black in this game. This person is from Hungary. Hungary. E4. So I played Karo Khan last time. Uh, I'm going to play D5. I'm going to play my Black Gambit's repertoire. Now, we might not get a Black Gambit's repertoire, right, against Knight F6. Like, if my opponent doesn't defend the pawn or play D4, they might play, yeah, Knight F3, for example, Bishop G4. Um, this, is the, this is what I like to play in the Black Gambit's stuff. Um, mm, this is a very annoying line, actually. Okay, let's play an endgame. Let's see how my opponent's endgame skills are. Actually, knight d5 is a, is a good move here, but I'm going to trade queens. And we're just going to play a queenless position. So I don't get any aggressive stuff. Uh, bishop attacks, you can either protect. Uh, I'm going to rotate my knight and attack the bishop back. Uh, and then I think what I'm going to do here, because I've traded my light squared bishop, is play a bit more solidly, so my pawn is going to stand on the sixth rank. Now, make no mistake, I am not better at all. Uh, white absolutely has all of the advantages here. Two bishops, uh, potential to take a big center. So there's a lot of, uh, wow, look at that, right on cue. Well done, c3. So I'm thinking c5 and then knight c6. So 
I think I see what my opponent wants, right? So I'm going to play c5. So the, even in the opening, you can jostle back and forth here for positioning. I'm going to... Okay, so this is already a, a slight concession for me, for like in, in favor of me, right? That they didn't actually get to play the move d4. I actually got to take a little bit of space. Also, that's not guarded. That's the first thing I notice. Like if I double, if I put my rooks on the d file, now I'm thinking even long castle here. It's castle long. Of course, there is just rook d8, but why not long castle? I, I don't actually see a reason I wouldn't castle queenside, so I'm just going to do it. Uh, and now I'm, uh, see, within a span of three, four moves, my opponent has actually, what? I think they just forgot I could take. Oh my God. I think they're just playing a little too quickly. Look at that. Four moves later, I'm already, I'm already doing well. Crazy. All right, slow it down. I understand we're nervous. Now I want to double my rooks. Just make sure your rook doesn't get trapped. Make sure you always have a way home. So bishop e7, my rook is going to get some backup. Knight c4, interesting. If I take, I lose my rook. So what if I take first? And I wouldn't think twice here about trading knights because you're already up a pawn. So now, now the next phase of the game is just about like winning an endgame. Like you, you could play rook d8 here. In fact, I might just play rook d8. So we just have an endgame lesson. I mean, we've traded every piece, right? Like rook d8 is a t totally reasonable move. You could play slower. You could play like a6 to prevent bishop b5, slowly move your pawns up. But I feel like the position where it's just two bishops is much easier to play against than a position with a rook and more pieces. Now, the opponent could walk away from a rook trade, and then I will still have to begin my slow expansion, because that's the end, at the end of the day, it's how you play chess, right? Slow expansion, especially in endgames. So they might walk away from the rook trade, but whatever. It's going to be a different type of uh, game if that happens. Um... But yeah, it's, it's pretty funny, like, on the one hand, my opponent blundered a pawn, and I'm just better. On the other hand, I, I still have to win. <laughs> I, don't, I don't just get to, like, be up a pawn and, and chill. Uh, okay, so you could, I, I don't know what I'm going to do here. You know what I might do? Uh, yeah, why not? Why not? I want to trade bishops. Let's do bishop versus... So that's actually instructive, to isolate a knight versus a bishop here. Uh, especially when you're a pawn up. So now I'm offering another trade. My opponent might trade. Yes, people do this. People will sometimes just trade for the sake of trading because they think that with less pieces on the board, they can't lose. So now um, it's very important the way you handle your pawns here. On the one hand, you want to push your pawns in a way that kick out the king, but you want to do it so you control everything. So I would start with g5 and then f5 check. But if I play g5, opponent goes g4 and I don't get to play f5. And then we're kind of frozen. So I'm going to play a6. And I want to slowly build up against this bishop, right? I want to take some space on the queen side. But I have to be careful because this bishop will go back and continue to kind of annoy me over here, right? So as I'm doing this, I do have to be mindful of the fact that I'm, these pawns could be targets in the long run. I'm thinking c4. I think c4 is a nice move. My pawns are now all very strong and tight-knit. Uh, and now f5, so I'm, I'm, I'm beginning, I'm beginning that expansion. Uh, maybe g5 now, or maybe h5, h, g5, h5, maybe king e5, right? We don't know. Maybe h6, so that I'm not ever weak here. I like this. I'm going to play h6, so that my h7 pawn is never a target for the bishop in the distance. I also have the option to play a5, b4. So my knight supports that queenside expansion as well. Also, this is a forking opportunity if my opponent is not careful. So g4, I, I, I think I'm going to bring my king to defend my center, which is very important. You got you to have the active king, the active knight, more activity than the opponent, and um, kind of slowly put that pressure on them. I'm not taking because I don't want to split my pawns. So that's the only reason I'm not taking here. Uh, I'm going to go, I, I am going to go with king e5. My king is definitely more active. And then if my opponent goes here, I might play f4 check to take some more space. I might also play g5 preventing f4. I don't know yet. Okay, a4, trying to open up another front. But I did just mention that b4 is a huge possibility for me as is. So taking on a4 was, oh, don't take back, fork. Oh gosh, that is the only thing the opponent had to avoid. 
They could have had a chance to hold it in the long run, but unfortunately, yeah, knight d4 now, and this is also a fork, and uh, they resign. Wow. I mean, they played too fast. I think that's all that happened. Velirad, as you saw, just played a little bit too quickly. Um, now, this position uh, that I mentioned is plus 0.3, so it's just very slightly better for white due to the two bishops. Um, and I played e6, c3. I went for c5 to prevent d4. And uh, yeah, here, kind of tragically, my opponent just blundered a pawn. And I mean, that's just a clean pawn. And bishop e7 was the best move. Trading and trading was the best move. A computer doesn't fully support rook d8. Actually, now it does. That's really funny. It thought for a little bit. Now the computer thinks that black's best chance to win cleanly is to trade like this. Does it like bishop c7? It does, and it thinks that actually taking is a huge mistake. So don't rush with exchanges, especially when you're a pawn down. Keep your two pieces on the board. The two bishops together are very powerful. This is just a losing endgame. You know, because I play king d6, I play a6, b5, um, c4 is the best move to create that nice wall. And then I just have to start expanding over here. And that's what I did. You know, I played king e5. Now, if this hadn't occurred, like if my opponent just sort of chilled for a second, um, I would have done this. So I have this nice wall here as well. And then I probably would have just walked over to, to c5 and tried to go here. Or, you know, something like this. a5, b4, b3. Take as much space away from my opponent as possible and then, uh, and then strike. At the same time, don't overcommit your pawn moves. So king e3, maybe I would have just gone here. Take space, keep my confident king in the middle of the board. King uh, ninety seven, ninety five, 95, find a way in. But... Yeah, as it happened, they just, uh, you know, they just, uh, they, yeah, chess is hard. That was a very fast game. I was not expecting that game to be so quick, but I think uh, nerves sometimes play a role. And this is one of the reasons I really like the Gambit's course for black, because even if you don't get a super aggressive Gambit, I mean, you still get a very safe and playable position. Uh, the Gambit's repertoire being, of course, the Portuguese Gambit, oops, Portuguese Gambit, which you can now get for 40% off. Very aggressive and crazy gambit, as well as the Icelandic gambit, like this. Queen e7 attacks the king, quick long castle. I really like those lines. But even if you don't get them, you still get an interesting game. Okay, next person is named Snack, which is something I really need right now, because it's 11 in the morning and I haven't eaten anything. Hilarious profile photo. So I played uh, the Trumpowski last time. Uh, I think this time I might play in English. Because again, at 1900, uh, anything is possible, right? So I'm, uh, you can get any sort of opening. So c4 is a, is a totally unique, a totally unique opening. Uh, and uh, yeah, against e5, this is like the reverse Sicilian. Uh, white has a couple of options. White can play knight f3, knight g3. Sorry, knight f, oh my god, knight f3, knight, knight c3, or g3. I'm going to go with g3. So I'm going to play the king's English. Uh, the idea is to put the bishop on g2 to patrol the diagonal. Uh, the best way to play here for black is to play c6, d5. What? It what? What is this? What? All right, well, I guess this is going to be a lesson in handling dumb openings. <laughs> Interesting. Knight h6. Wow. Um, so the, actually, anytime I see something like this, uh, my first instinct is to play d3 and take it to damage the pawn structure and make my opponent play with the damage structure. So something like d3. So to do this. The dog is barking again. It's insane. I mean, like, no one's taking this dog inside. Okay, knight f7. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. So... What is the game plan here for black exactly? I'm trying to figure this out. I don't, I don't exactly understand what my opponent wants. So I think I'm going to play this in a typical English style. e3, knight e2. So this is uh, the way you kind of team up with this bishop. Second time in this video we've seen a powerful kingside bishop, by the way. And then I'm going to expand on this side of the board. Okay, so bishop b4. I'm re uh, re kind of reinforcing this knight so that if the capture happens, I don't, lose, uh, I don't damage my structure. And now a3. Typical uh, uh, King's, uh, King's English expansion here with b4, b5 to complement the bishop on g2. White is uh, already much better. Actually, this is just not... I don't know what my opponent's doing. I hope I'm not getting trolled. I hope this is actually how my opponent plays. I would hate if a 1900 uh, volunteered and just played like uh, garbage on purpose. But I, I don't think that's what my opponent is doing. I think that's just his repertoire. 
or her repertoire. I don't know. Uh, but uh, wow, G5. Okay, well, lesson in dealing with aggression, yeah? B5 is good. D4 is good. Uh, last game, we talked about a principled way to deal with a flank strike is in the middle. So I think I'm going to boot the knight from, this, from, from, from its post. I could take here, by the way. That is a free pawn. I thought they were going to go knight a5. I mean, listen, you give me a free pawn, I'm going to take the free pawn to pawn. So, there we go. And, oh, so many issues today in this recording. But you're not an issue. You're great. Oh, crack my entire back there, too. I'm hungry. Dog is just, I, I don't know. This is driving me nuts. I, mostly from a logical standpoint. I'm just like, why is it even out there barking still? It sounds like a small dog, too. It smells like a yappy dog. It's scared? Take it inside. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm getting attacked. So I could play h4 just like last time, but I'm not even castled this way, which is kind of funny. You know what I mean? Like, I... What if I just chill and don't get scared? I don't know. I... I <laughs> seems kind of reasonable. h4 is also uh, a good move, though, because it, it forces something here, right? He still forces something here. If gh4, I'm actually going to take with my rook. I'm going to fight back. Because I haven't castled. Why, why, why am I scared? My king is not there. My king can always go queenside. Literally, takes three moves. Boop, boop, queenside castle. And you've set up this whole attack on the king side for no reason. So that's the thing. You have to, you have to know what you're attacking, right? Um, g4 freezes the pawn attack. So it's a very tough decision here for black. I think the best move for black might be knight g6. Knight g6 looks very decent. And uh, if he... If they play it after I, uh, after I say it, it's not because they're listening. It's because uh, they're a good player. I'm recording this in my house, so they would have to have my house bugged in order to know what I'm saying. Uh, oh, real quick, by the way. I, 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 oh, that's not a good move because now there's no F4. Uh, I, if you want to participate in future episodes, you just have to be a subscriber. And you have to be a member of the Discord. That is where I pull volunteers. Cool. Queen A4. I'm going to go win this A pawn, and I'm going to be two pawns up. Queen A4 is just an annoying move. It, it, it's kind of a reminder to black that they have nothing, and I'm going to slowly pick up their position, and then I'm going to win. Oh, that is a, such a welcome sight for me. I mean, the one thing I wanted was my opponent to actually admit that there is no attack. So I'm thinking knight d5. I have a lot of nice moves forward here. I think I can even play bishop d5. Very, very... I can even castle now. I'm actually kind of safe enough that I, that I would be able to castle. I don't know what the best move is, though. I don't know what the best move is. Castling is exciting. I don't know how good it is. I'm going to castle. Let's have some fun. Let's bait my opponent. I'm kind of making fun of the attack at this point. I'm like, haha. All these pawns you push toward my king and you have nothing. My king is going to safely hide behind uh, those two pawns there. I'm definitely playing with fire here, but even f3 to crack open my own f-file looks pretty appetizing. So, not What? <laughs> wow. Knight g5. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. That is uh that is impressive. I got to listen, I got to give it to my opponent. They are definitely brave. I I so you can take, but you know what? I I I don't want to. I don't want to take. I think I'm going to attack with the bishop here. I don't want to take We'll analyze after, but sometimes in positions that are so good, there's no need to allow a crazy counterplay. No need to allow it. Right, f4, but this allows me to capture, right? Huh, did I allow it anyway? Pretty wild. If I take, the knight moves. Queen comes in. Wow. Wow. Maybe I have to take now. This is nuts. Okay, no. Everything is fine, but... This is a very interesting attack. 
I could have taken and we would have had the same thing. So knight g5, I would have taken queen g5 and then I would have played e4. That was one of my ideas. But um, this is, there's no way this works for black. Let's put it this way. But it looks terrifying, I must say. As the person who is responsible for defending against this, this looks very scary. So part of me here understands that h4 is coming. And so I understand I have to, like, I have to strike now. But if I take on f4 and they take... I gotta get to that pawn somehow. So I'm thinking knight d5. I actually think that uh, getting to f4 is important. So here, if h4, I take f4. And I don't allow my opponent anything. Also, if h4... Yeah, of course, I literally just said that this was gonna happen. Um, if I take on f4, that attacks the queen. The queen might move. I still think this is correct, because if takes, I'm, another piece joins the party, right? If queen h5, I win a queen. If queen h6, I play f5. So this tempo on the queen saves the attack for now. The h3 doesn't scare me anymore because the queen is hanging. If the queen goes to g7, I don't know. I don't know if I should be scared or not. And if the attack is still kind of rolling in. But my queen's stupid. My queen is not doing a good job right now. <clears throat> Let's see, queen g7, man. The more I look at it, the more I actually start believing that queen g7 is, 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 is possible and uh, h3 is coming. Crazy. There it is, wow. Played. This is, this is unreal. If this attack actually, can this attack actually possibly work? I really am not respecting this attack the way I should be, I feel like. G3 is gonna come in in a move. Oh my God, this is crazy. So I want to come back to C2 so that I can meet all of this with something. Like maybe, but man, H3, is, this is insane. King H2? No, then G3. I can even take with check, but that doesn't do anything. I don't think it does anything. Bishop H1? Wow. Hmm. This is nuts. I don't know how to stop H3, G3. How do I stop H3, G3? I am completely flabbergasted. I don't know. Maybe queen b3 and d4 somehow? Like, I, I, I am completely at a loss for ideas. h3. Yeah, so I'm thinking just d4 here to get my queen back into the game. Something like d4, h takes, king takes, queen goes there, and then I play queen g3. But there might be... I don't know. Crazy. What is going on in this position? I don't even think I'm better anymore. What the heck is this? Part of me is just holding out hope that he plays queen h7 and then, uh... Does he have g3? 
G3, maybe F5. Because G3 is a, the, the, the point of G3 is that he, uh, he gets the, the, the light squared bishop in from D7. Okay, Queen H6, yes. I just talked about this, Queen G3. This was my entire point. I'm like defending against mate. And then what? I think the attack has been stopped. Which means that I probably am in good shape. If I can now begin to like play fe5, knight f6, etc., I should be fine. I should be good. I don't know. I'm still up two points of material. Now I'm much more focused in this uh, in this game because I'm on the verge of death here, so I have to be ultra focused, or else that will be the end of me. I've also spent a significantly larger amount of time than I did in the last game. Okay, I don't I don't think knight b6 is a good move, but I have to speed up, so I'm gonna take on e5. So I have to play faster now. I take on e5, queen h3, he, t I, he checks me. I get in front of the pawn. He might take my knight. I'm going to take back with my e pawn. He also has knight c4, which I just realized. Then I can take... That was very weird accent. I can take with check. So I think I'm winning again. I'm definitely winning again. Um, I'm going to be up a lot of pawns, which I think is three when the count is up. Wow. Do I have e6? Check. No. F4. I'm just going to bring all my pawns to this party. Actually, wait a minute. I still have to respect him for some reason. Like, he has some weird... Oh my god. It's like not over somehow. Crazy. Okay, I'm gonna play e6. I don't know how this attack just hasn't died yet. It's insanity. f4. I guess he can play rook b5. But I'm gonna get my rook out this way. This is, a, this is one of the crazier games of how to win at chess that I can remember. So I'm gonna play rook a2, rook c2, or rook a2, rook e2, and we're just gonna push our pawns. Same way we won the endgame in the very first endgame against Vlad. We're gonna get our uh, we're gonna get our pawns together. This knight is sort of obsolete now. It feels like feels like it's not really part of the game anymore. Somehow it's not doing anything. Yeah, so he takes. I'm gonna play rook a two. And now I'm ready. I I, I could have also played f five e five. These kind of moves. That's coming. But first, I want to ask my opponent what he's doing. I also think d five is gonna happen, and it's a bad move because I can play f five e five. So that, that would be quite nice for me. D5? F5 looks good. D5 looks good. Rook C2 is interesting. Let's go Rook C2. So if he takes my last pawn over here, I'm thinking D5 and then just drive straight into the position. Actually, I could maybe even just cut off the king completely and just try to checkmate him. That might just be the idea here. Rook c7, disallow him any moves. Yeah, I'm going to play rook c7. I just have to make sure I can't be checked myself. So I'm now threatening... Uh, I should have a mate somewhere. Maybe I'm threatening just a big win of material somehow. I am also, at the end of the day, just threatening one more pawn. He has the weirdest pawn structure I have seen in a while. So... My pawns are all three together, ready to go down the board. It's a mini lesson in, you know, in pawn structure and pawn clumps. Wow, but this is a... I, there was not much to talk about in this game. This game was absolutely nuts. Just completely nuts. It's very difficult in games like this to even 
summarize things, you know? Like, I, I usually try to give general advice from certain situations. This game was beyond general advice. All right, F5 check, and hopefully he just blunders checkmate. That would be nice. Thank you. He blundered mate. Wow. All right, well, uh, let's take a look. Knight g5. And here, knight d5 was good. gf4 was good. And I just totally freaked out here. And queen b3 is just not a good move at all. I spent so much time here. Apparently, bishop h1 is the way to go. But I was so scared of g3. Oh, wow. Wow. Just, there's nothing. He can walk in, and I can just... <sighs> that was terrifying by my opponent, honestly. That was really scary. Yeah, what he got uh, in this position was um, apparently c6 wins, which is a crazy move. Uh, but his playing style is so annoying. And uh, by the way, after queen h6, queen g3, now I'm winning again. He was winning for a move here. He had to apparently play c6. That was a horrible playing style to deal with. Just belligerent aggression. I mean, uh, the entire game. He was losing for so long, but I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I just let him, I let him get going. I shouldn't have done that. Big mistake by me. Huge mistake on my part to just let all these pawns avalanche forward. And then I just, uh, I decided to sacrifice a piece and consolidate with my queen. I mean, this, th this queen b3 pawn, look at this, queen b3 pawn opening the queen and then coming over here is, uh, it's advanced, but it's overkill. Not necessary. And, um, yeah, crazy. <laughs> that was, uh, insane game. Completely insane. I, 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 I totally freaked out with that attack incoming, so... Good, good mini lesson there. I mean, honestly, attack, attack, attack. Even international masters will falter uh, in the eyes of uh, in the eyes of the attack. My last opponent is um, not online. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to summon them. All right, I'm gonna wait like 15, 20 seconds. Um. <clears throat> All right, let's see if they have made it online. If they didn't make it online, then it's going to be extremely tragic. We will just have to cut the recording. Uh, but if not, then... Okay, my opponent is saying that they are online. They are not online. Maybe they spelled their username wrong. <clears throat> well, thanks for hanging out, folks. I mean, hopefully an hour and seven minutes into this, if we have a one-minute technical difficulty, then... Uh... What can you do? People will volunteer to play, and they don't even know how to get into the... Okay, there we go. My opponent is online. Finally. All right, let's play some chess. They get white. They're 2100. Their username is Lucifer. I've played my opponent one time. E4. Uh, for this last game, I'm going to be playing E6, B6, which is also one of my courses for the black pieces. I'm going to be playing E6, B6 setup. I really like this setup. I think it's very easy to play, but obviously it's a, it, it, it's easy, it gets easier to play as you go up the rating ladder, because you have to play with a lack of space. So bishop d3, I'm gonna play d5. This is very standard stuff. Yep, e5, and now I'm gonna play c5. So we have a French defense. Now, French defense structure, I should say. Now, one of the ways I play this with black is I put this knight on c6, uh, and then queen c8 and bishop a6. So this bishop, because white has so many pawns on dark squares, the light square bishop for white is the better bishop, because otherwise the dark square bishop is sort of boxed in. And so we have a passive bishop. So what we do is we play moves like queen c8 and bishop 2a6, and we try to get rid of that really strong light squared bishop. And we might get a situation like we got in the Vlad game, 
where the opponent has so many pawns on dark squares that their dark square bishop is just very bad. Uh, so, at bishop a6, we're going to trade, then we're going to continue with the, uh, the, the, the uh, demolition of the queen side. Very similar, actually, to that Vlad game. So some of these, some of these openings, they have uh, typical structures, typical ways of playing. I just realized that I was supposed to charge my phone this entire recording. I did not do that. See, once you watch long enough of a Win at Chess episode, you just get all parts of my uh, daily life. Yeah, so... Okay, bishop a6. Doesn't really matter what white is doing. This is our strategy. We're trying to make that, uh, I mean, trade that bishop. <clears throat> well, bishop a6 is very natural, but actually, oh my god, that would have been horrible if I pre-moved that. But bishop c2, uh, bishop c2 is actually what I expect, just not trading. Because it's very clear what I want with my gameplay, right? Uh, now this bishop will develop um, once we move the knight. Also, just a very flexible move is h6, preventing a bishop or a knight from ever coming there. Okay, he takes. I mean castles. Why did I say takes? I'm going to take. And again, we have a situation where... Why is he thinking? There's nothing to think about here. Is he getting a phone call? So... We're gonna. I. 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 I'm, I want to play a queenless position like we did against uh, v v v v v v v v v Velirad. Trying to play a queenless middle game, queen a6, and try to play on this with this queenside expansion. This is one of the key components of the e6 b6 stuff. You don't have to trade queens, but now for the remainder of the game, I'm gonna focus on over here. And it's actually kind of nice to play queenless positions. They, you can learn a lot about various middle game structures. <laughs> you also will never get mated <laughs> when there's no queens on the, on the board. Um, H6 is, is now actually going to be very nice because the bishop will have to get kicked away. And then I will... So H6, of course, uh, uh, without even hesitation, I will ask that bishop where it's going. Now, if the bishop gets locked away on G3, I'm very happy because it's not participating in the game whatsoever. Um, if, okay, but that is not locking the bishop away, so we have to still, still deal with the bishop. So I think knight a5 here is smart. Controlling c4, ready with rook c8. If the opponent takes, I'm taking with the pawn, so nothing can get to d4. So takes, takes, nothing gets to d4, and also I open up the b file. If they don't take, then I'm just going to slowly but surely bring my rooks, and then at some point I will open things up. All right, that is the plan. <clears throat> B3, I think C4 is the idea. I wanna play C4, but then I get kicked out and I don't really like that. So now I just have to think about rook c8, I think. c4, the point is that I'm going to take, then take, and then take the pawn on c4. So I'm noticing that my opponent is getting a little antsy. People in general, even at the 2100 level, get very antsy because they, 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 nobody likes to sit in a position and completely unsure what to do, right? Just sit there. So everybody's trying to do something. Very few people can just slowly improve the position. And when you understand after moves like b3 that c4 is the idea, right? Maybe now they're going to take and try to play c4 really desperately. You, you unlock so many parts of chess once you get in front of your opponent's thought process. Just incredible. Right? Knight d2 is still preparing c4, it looks like. Wow. Really dedicated to this move. Makes me wonder if I should be worried about it. I really want to play it. I'm thinking like b5, but then takes is much stronger. Yeah, c4, I don't, I don't like that because I get kicked out. And uh, I don't know. I really don't want to. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to get booted from the position. So maybe bishop b7. It's annoying. Very annoying. Hmm. I could take. 
I could take. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take and ask my opponent what they want. And then what I'm gonna do, I think, is I'm gonna I'm gonna just play on the queen side. So my knights are very active. These pieces, these knights are very bad in quality compared to mine. Mine will jump in, attack stuff. Oh. Interesting. I did not expect that move. Because now I just have a clean target, right? So bishop a3. Ah, knight b4. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Completely missed that move. I mean, knight b5, what am I doing? It's late. It's late in the episode. I'm getting sloppy. Wow, I can't even do anything. I have to, like, uh, I have to still respect this threat. If I play rook c3, knight b5 is so strong. Wow. Yeah, knight d4 is actually a very legit move. I just talked about how my knights are, are better than the knights uh, that white has, and then I activated white's knight. Very sloppy. Very sloppy. Man, and knight c7, my, my bishop is getting shrugged. Unbelievable. Okay. I guess I'm going to go back. Oops. All right. Well, time to open up the next stage of the game, which is uh, Levy fights back. <laughs> rather, than, rather than me actually pushing the initiative, I guess c takes d4 was just inaccurate. I, I, for some reason, I did not even think about knight takes d4. I was like, uh, knight d4 is never going to happen. I mean, because I just have a pawn target. I thought white would have to get the same structure as me. Yeah, there's knight b5. At this level, you're going to get punished. Okay, I'm going to bring my knight back and guard this. I'm also going to implement a game plan here, which is uh, something you definitely should be implementing in your own games. The clock. So I'm not happy with my position. I'm going to focus. I'm going to buckle down. And I'm going to make sure that that inaccuracy was the only inaccuracy I made. And the clock is now a piece. I'm up two and a half minutes on the clock. So there's c4. So I don't want to take and activate another knight. That is the last thing that I want to do in this position. So I think uh, I don't have to do much, right? But I could trade knights. I could also reinforce. Right? So I think I'm going to go knight c7. I think maybe I'm gonna castle. Let me castle. Simple moves. Simple moves. Castle. Spent 20 seconds on that move, but it's okay. So just simple move. Castle, gonna get my rook into the game. Might not be playing the most accurate, but I am defending against unpleasant things. So right, knight f3, rook d8, take, take, something like that. Take, take, knight f3, rook d8. Are we worse? Mm, I doubt it. It's probably just equal. It's just an equal position, but. I'm not super happy. Okay, a3 is not a good move. That move doesn't do anything. But I have made mistakes in this game already once. So now I'm bringing my rook. So like I said, just simple moves. Simple moves. Not overthinking anything. Playing faster. Just playing solid, smart. Uh, actually, if my opponent waits another move, I can, I can push. Which I will, will relieve a lot of pressure in the position. I also would really like to trade this knight. So I'm, I, at some point, I would love if my a6 knight could trade off for that knight and I no longer have to worry about anything. If anybody's wondering why I haven't taken here, it's because knight takes a7. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm up three minutes on the clock now, right? That is huge. I'm not happy with my position, but I was slightly worse. I wasn't losing. Maybe I was slightly worse, but um, <clears throat> there's b4. So now I'm thinking d4. I'm also thinking knight c7. They both look good. They both look okay. I think I'm going to go with knight c7. I'm going to trade off this knight. Let's pre-move this move if it happens. Uh, and uh, again, no weaknesses. Chilling, solid, removing my opponent's most active piece, building that time advantage. We haven't used the clock that much. I've tried to just play the best move, but clock is a piece, especially, uh, especially in a timed game. I mean, in a 10-minute game, when you don't like your position, you can absolutely speed things up. <clears throat> so now rook d5 i think i mean pawn d5 is also a very interesting move but i like rook takes because this pawn's a weakness just like in those Karo Khan positions the e5 pawn is looking um looking very suspicious and if you defend it with a pawn you immediately create more weaknesses for me and if i win this i'm gonna win this so that time advantage is now nearly four minutes and the position has only gotten worse and worse for white because white is feeling that pressure knight f3 is a decent move Let's look at this. Simple. Reinforcing. Boom. Right? Reinforcing. Gonna take on e5 or take this. 
If my opponent takes, we take. So same situation. Don't trade rooks if you have... We also could have played knight takes e5, I think. This did win a pawn. Maybe, no, 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 no. Maybe not. Take, take, x-ray. <sighs> Tough. So don't trade rooks when you have that same file, right? When you have the same file, you want to reinforce your rooks so you dominate the file. Now we are up four minutes. So we've totally changed this game because we kind of changed the pace at which we were playing. And we're still better, right? We, we, we made a slight inaccuracy. I got a little frustrated with myself. Um, that's actually not free because of this, but I think I'm just going to... Uh, A5 is also very interesting. But yeah, I should probably just take on E5. Probably should just take on E5. Also, no back rank mate. So because we played H6 a very long time ago, see, that's a major difference. The opponent has two minutes. I anticipate rook c7 or rook c8 check. But because we always have back rank stuff, we have bishop g5, basically at all times. That's so king h7. I also could go bishop f8, but there's no reason to pin yourself. Don't pin your pieces to each other. No need to do that, right? Bishop g5. Seems smart. Rook f7. Oh man, my opponent might actually be making a comeback here. But maybe not. I'm going to play a5 so that they can't take my pawn. They still can't take my bishop. Because back rank mate. And I'm getting this pawn out of the way of the rook. Takes, takes. I think white has played very well in this game. Hopefully they play rook a7 and then they blunder rook e3. That would be heartbreaking. For them. For me, it would be outstanding. For them, it would be heartbreaking. Uh, okay, let's... Take... Take... King g6. All right, rook d5. We gotta... I'm threatening two things here, I think. So I'm threatening... Obviously, back rank mate, but I'm also threatening some rook d3 stuff in the future. Maybe check and rook a1. I also feel like I don't need to trade the bishop anymore. My bishop is better than white's bishop. This pawn is a liability because I can always put my a pawn there and then try to go get it. Maybe bishop e7 was a little bit better. But I also like this. I think this is fine. Rook b5. Looking at all this stuff over here. We are more active. So at the end of the day, we're more active and we're much closer to winning our opponent's weakness. So this pawn is on the exact square we need it to be. So check. If king d3, rook b3, we win the pawn. So that forces the king to the back rank. Mm. Mm. A4 maybe? Very tricky position. Rook b3. You know what I could do? I could make the bishop move and damage the pawns. That's another way I could try to win this position. So, for example... Takes and bring my king. And I'm willing to argue that my king is far better than white's king here. Because these pawns are so bad. And I'm, re I'm ready to just go win them. Like, I'm ready to just walk down over here and, and take the pawns. H5, G5. Maybe G5 was better first. Something like this. Another thing is I can put my, my pawn on H3. So again, we have a situation... Good move. We have a situation here where... Uh, all the pawns for white are very passive. Now we, we are... Ooh... I think this allows us to trade off into a winning endgame. This must be a winning endgame. Bishop e5 takes, takes, a4, king f5. King d... King d... Okay. Man, I mean... Oh! I can also wall out this as the smart way. The bishop is now gone from the game. Now we play a4. Bishop e7. We take the pawn and... Uh, this was a, a really nice uh, mini lesson on endgames and peace activity. And playing with the clock. Like, the clock is a piece. And we play a3. 
Uh, and we use this as a decoy to go get the F2 pawn and then all the rest of the pawns. Um, so this game, we had a nice position, uh, but uh, it was equal. And then, yeah, I mean, I just went completely crazy, allowing knight b5. Um, if we back up a little bit, like here, white is always, uh, white is always, according to Stockfish, a touch, touch preferred because of the space advantage. But personally, I really like these queenside expansion positions. Um, I really like black's prospects. <clears throat> Of putting pressure in the end game. But I think here we played very smart. I think uh I think we, we played a pretty smart game. And uh yeah, I guess I mean rook c1 was a very smart move. Apparently the top engine move here is bishop d8. Wow. Bishop d8 to try to win. Wow, bishop d8 is ridiculous. The point of bishop d8 is there's no rook c7. Incredible. Look, here there's rook c8, rook c7, which I, I, I forgot about. But here there's uh, bishop d8. You can't take my knight because mate. And if you go here, there's uh, no rook c7. Crazy. Wow. What a game that was. And the end game was definitely equal, but I think black was the one playing for anything. So I think here I could have been a little bit more accurate. Actually, according to Stockfish, I played all the best moves for a while there. Um, but here it's black playing for, for win because the, when you damage your position like this and your structure, I have such an easy approach to your pawns. So I can take as much space as I can. And then, yeah, I mean, once you lock yourself out, uh, it's probably just game over. Um, so anyway, folks, uh, that was a lot of fun. I don't know if you made it an uh, hour and a half in the video. Please let me know if you did. Recording these takes a lot of energy because it's just 90 minutes straight of high-level play, thinking, etc. So... Uh, use code 20, T-W-E-N-T-Y, all courses 40% off, and I will see you uh, in the next How to Win at Chess episode or the next video that you're watching. That's all. Get out of here.